Okay, it's just seven o'clock. Welcome to the 25th of February, 2021 virtual Newburyport Historical Commission meeting. Glenn Richards chair here. Um, we're just um, taking, give us just a few seconds to see if we have a couple additional members that uh, joined via the um, participant side. Let's see. Oh yeah, Mark is in there. So can you correct, can you um, uh, not graduate, <laughs> elevate, whatever the word promote. is, promote, promote Mark. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, great. So Malcolm, I don't see him yet, but why don't we um, get started? I'll run through a few introductory remarks and then we'll take the official roll call in and begin. Uh, as with all, you, you, most attendees by now are familiar with uh, Zoom meetings, but uh, that's how this meeting will be held as per usual. Uh, there will probably be a public comment period tonight. If you are attending in which to make a comment, you must use the functionality of the, of the Zoom system to raise your hand so we know that you want to make a comment and then once we recognize you we will unmute you on our end you will need to unmute yourself on your end as well if you're calling in by the telephone you use star nine to raise a hand and star six to unmute yourself um, and uh, also commissioners when you either make a motion or a second motion um, to helpful to, to state your name usually we know you by voice and or just or whatever, but it helps the note taker know who's who's making motions and seconding and so on. So thank you for that. All right, so let's go through the roll, see who's here. Uh, I assume Mr. Conrath is not here yet, right? Oh, no, there he is, Malcolm. So Malcolm, you're there. I see you. Is your audio going? All right, we'll give Malcolm, we'll give you a, if you can hear me, we'll give you another minute or, or a few seconds to get your audio going, but I do see you. So it looks like you're muted locally. See if you can unmute yourself. Meanwhile, I'll go on to Mr. Sandrone. Are you here? I am present. Oh, yep. There you are. Bonjour. Uh, Mr. Fay. Christopher here. Fay. Okay. Here. Peter McNamee. Here. Okay. Mr. Joe Morgan. Present. Ms. Uh, Patricia Pecknick. Yes. And myself, Claire Richards, and looks like Malcolm. Looks like you've managed to unmute yourself, right? Malcolm, say something. Oh, still not hearing you. Why are we not hearing you? All right. Well, we see you. Can Malcolm make a gesture of some sort if you can hear me? So at least I know you're hearing me. Okay, good. You hear me. All right, work on your audio there. See if you can get that going while we continue on. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a demo delay application, uh, DCOD, um, uh, 37 Prospect Street. I believe we have uh, Attorney Mead and Architect Jeff Tucker here to address that. Let's see, are they here in attendees? Um, Okay, yep, the same as Mead, and we're enabling your audio for both of you. So this, uh, what we'll do is we want to try to be clear uh, in, over the past two years we've been involving this step one, step two procedure. At any rate, there'll be at least two votes required here. The first vote is a very simple one on whether or not the structure is historically significant. Uh, I suspect that will be a fairly short discussion, and then a much uh, more involved discussion on the actual plans and the proposal and, and public comment and so forth and so on. So, um, Ms. Uh, Mead, I see your audio is enabled. Do you, do you wanna uh, introduce your uh, proposal here? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And for the record, Lisa Mead, Mead, Teller and Costa on 33 Street in the report. And with me this evening uh, listening is Brian and Ashley Price, who are the homeowners here. They, they and their family uh, reside at this location. Um, and Jeff, uh, perhaps maybe somebody could now mute Malcolm. Um, so, uh, then um, Jeff Tucker, who is uh, Tucker Architects and is um, present also. Uh, as the chair indicated, we're here for a demo delay for a roof line change. Uh, the proposal is to remove one, uh, one story addition on the rear corner of the property. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
uh, the property is at 37 Prospect Street, and um, I'm sure many of you know uh, this building. It's quite a distinct building. Uh, it is a described as a federal style structure. Uh, it's the his, the has a historic name of the Enoch Osgood House. It was constructed in or around 1810, uh, and it does have a form B associated with it. It is a three story building currently being used as a single family home. Uh, as mentioned, the project does not involve any of the uh, any renovation or removal of except for a window or two, which we're going to talk about of the three story original portion of the structure. Uh, but instead, uh, the proposals to remove a later added, albeit also historic, one story addition on the rear, uh, along with a roof deck and a small room that has been built on top of that, in addition to a pressure treated pergola. The Sanborn maps, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the Sanborn maps from 1880 to 1914 indicate that the one story addition was added in or around 1906 and 1914. So on this plan, you can see we've highlighted it. It actually says, um, this is the 1900 Sanborn map. Uh, this actually is noted as, as 27 prospect, but that's because there was a renumbering. Uh, so you can see there are actually two structures on one lot at one point in time, but that's this is before that corner was filled in and there was actually a, an addition on the rear back left corner. If you go to the 1906 Sanborn map, you'll see that that rear left addition has been removed, but uh, the corner uh, easterly, northeasterly corner has been filled in by an addition. Um, so, uh, and then if you go to the next slide, uh, and this is just a little other perspective. In 1974, the lots, uh, there was a little lot line change and this lot now includes that kind of spoon off to the back there. So this is the a 1974 ANR that was approved. And the next slide, please. And then you see the location of the property today on Prospect Street. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I don't think we need to go much more into it. This is quite a distinct building. Uh, mm -hmm. In accordance with the ordinance, the board uh, can determine uh, that the structure is historically significant and preferably preserved. And we'll wait for you to do that before we do the rest of the presentation. All right, thank you, Attorney Mead. Um, any, anyone have any comment or questions uh, on this? I, as uh, I agree with Attorney Mead that it's a pretty straightforward case. It's a very well-recognized structure. Any, is any, Member of the board have a comment or question, or if not, we can have have a motion um, that it is historically significant and should be considered for preservation. I'll make that motion. Okay, it sounded like is that Joe? Malcolm. <laughs> Malcolm. Oh, thank you, Malcolm. Okay, yeah. so is that seconded? I'll second. Okay, it sounded like Mr. Fay, right? Okay, so we'll go around the roll. Uh, Malcolm Carnworth. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sindron? Yes. Okay, Mr. Fay? Yes. Okay, Mr. McNamee? Yes. Okay, Mr. Morgan? Uh, <clears throat> yes, we're, we're, we are voting on whether it is historically, uh, historically significant. significant. Is that correct? Correct. That's correct. I, That's... I agree. It is historically significant. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pecknick? Yes. Okay, and the chair is also an affirmative on that. So uh, it is, uh, at this point, it's historically significant and to be considered for preservation. Uh, so we'll I'll let, before we go to the public hearing, I'll go ahead and allow uh, um, Attorney Mead to, uh, well, present uh, what it is they plan to do here. Thank you very much. As you go to the next slide, please, Caitlin. So I just want to review, um, it's a very distinct structure. I probably should have showed these earlier, but this is the existing structure today. Uh, if you go down to the next slide. Um, and this slide is important. You can kind of see at the back of the driveway to the right, the existing addition on the rear. It's difficult. You have to be on top of this. These houses are close together, obviously in the south end, uh, but that's where the addition is going to go in the rear. And the proposal is to remove the existing addition, which you can kind of see um, from this um, angle. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, this is the actual addition in the rear that's proposed to come off and the location of the new addition to replace it. And if you can go to the next slide, please. 
And here's a picture from the backyard. Um, you can see the pergola on top. So the proposal is to remove that lower addition. In addition to that half um, kind of sloped roof addition on the top along with the pergola. Um, so like, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So the proposal, as I said, is to uh, renovate and restore the back part of the property or reconstruct the back addition uh, by removal of the current addition and putting on a new one. Um, the addition is uh, smaller in height um, and footprint than the original main house. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Caitlin. So here is the, um, the site plan. And you can see uh, that the um, proposal is to fill in where the other addition was and square it off with the house and actually go a little bit deeper than that. That's the red line, which is the extension. Um, it's uh, largely not visible uh, from a public way. Uh, there is a little bit of view of it, as you can see from the earlier photo. The proposed extension of the later added addition does not track from the main house elements of the historic structure. Uh, the proposed construction will fill in the footprint to the rear to coincide with the line of the easterly wall of the historic structure. Uh, further, all the siding and trim materials are going to match those of the existing structure. Um, and as um, I noted earlier, uh, there are a couple of windows on the westerly side of the um, existing structure that Jeff has a couple of modifications to that are noted on the plans. And with that, before I go into any more detail, I'm going to turn it over to the architect, Jeff Tucker, to go through the plans. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Tucker. I'm a, a, an architect with Tucker Architecture and Landscape in Marblehead. Um, as Lisa was describing, the left side of the house uh, actually has a narrower alley than the, the other side that she was describing. And you'll see that elevation in the upper left-hand side. That's an area that we want to uh, modify a few windows. The, there is one larger window that seems to be original to the house. That's the larger double hung two over two. And then there's two smaller windows that clearly, at least in my mind, were uh, added at some point, you know, uh, much more recently, uh, two small, um, <clears throat> excuse me, little fixed uh, windows there. Uh, the, the plan is actually to remove uh, all three of those windows and replace those two smaller ones with uh, two larger uh, windows of, of you know, kind of similar aspect. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this shows the proposed. Uh, so again, that upper left-hand uh, elevation shows two new uh, two light uh, awning windows that are in that same location as where those smaller ones were. And you'll note to the left-hand side of that, the double hung has been removed. Uh, the elevation on the right of this is the other alley elevation. These are really the two only elevations that you could possibly see from the street. Uh, so elevations one and two are the ones that, again, you get a little sneak peek at from the street up these alleys. Um, and on the right, you can see that we've removed the pergola. Uh, we've also removed, as Lisa described before, there's kind of an amalgam of um, kind of bumps and, and, and additions that were put on over the years in this kind of uh, crook in the back part of the building. Uh, the plan is to remove those and replace them with just two. Uh, so the upper piece is the master bedroom with a sloped roof going back into the, uh, again, the kind of crook or the L of the house. And the lower piece is a one-story addition that um, is going to house a kitchen and a mudroom. Uh, you can see that again on the very bottom. The bottom right uh, shows the rear elevation that shows those same additions on there. Uh, and also, as you can see from the bottom left-hand elevation that the front elevation remains entirely the same as it does today. There's no improvements planned there. Uh, if you can go to the next elevation. Uh, this just shows an overlay of the uh, proposed and the, uh, the existing. So this is uh, showing what areas of the building will be modified. It is less than 25% of the uh, total side wall of the building. So we've elevated every piece there and uh, calculated what the square footage of uh, sidewall is and, and what we're modifying. And I believe that's it for me. I, I, oh, actually, I can walk you through the plans here as well. If you go down to the next slide, uh, we're gonna be doing, as she described before, uh, this kind of a wraparound addition here that, that wraps around the back uh, corner, filling in what was uh, only previously before had a little bump on it. Uh, this is gonna be a crawl space, or sorry, a, a full basement in that area. 
um, with a bulkhead that's really tucked behind the building. You won't see that at all. If you can go to the next uh, slide, please. This, the toned area here shows the, uh, the added areas. So there's currently a kitchen in the location where we're showing a kitchen, but we're expanding it. Right now it is uh, very tight for their family. Uh, they also lack a powder room. So we're gonna be creating a powder room and a mud room off the side. Uh, currently the, the, that little tiny bump addition on the side is what houses their mud room and it's uh, far too small for uh, the kiddos there. So uh, the next uh, uh, sheet, please. Uh, this shows, um, th yeah, th this, this is another uh, plan of that same uh, piece. It's just an enlargement of that same area we discussed. You can go to the last one there. This shows the improvements to the second floor. Uh, currently, there's a very modest bedroom with no closets and very uh, poor access to the existing bath. Uh, the red lines you're seeing here are the pieces that we're removing. So you can see that we're going to be removing a pergola and filling that in with a uh, new master bedroom. And then the remaining piece is a, a deck that's over the first floor. And then we'll be doing improvements to the master bath, which is why we need to uh, uh, arrange those windows differently. Uh, if you can go to the next one, please. This one, I think, really points at the kind of mess that's out back, right? The, the front of the building is very distinctive, uh, very uh, pretty building, uh, worthy of preservation. Uh, but at the, at the rear of the building, you can see that there's been additions over time, these little kind of shed roof things, the the pressure treated pergola, the you know pretty awful railings and things like that that are up there, uh, and then the deck down below. So really, that will be removed and replaced with what our uh, proposal is. Uh, if you look at the very next slide, that is a rendering of what we propose to go in there. Um, I want to point one thing out here is that, that those are not flat roofs. As you can see from our elevations, those are all sloped. Uh, it's just that the, the, the low angles that these are taken at. So the existing roof is um, quite low slope uh, and, and our, you know, we're, we're representing that here as well. One, one note here is that uh, we don't mean to represent that there is any chimney removal. We're not. The uh, chimney is remaining in place. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so the applicants believe the proposed addition is in keeping with the historic uh, structure and does not detract from the historic significance of the structure. Uh, the addition is in that small section in the rear. Uh, the materials are compatible with the historic structure. Uh, specifically, the proposed new work will be uh, clad in wood clapboards with corner boards of similar size and exposure to the existing facade. Uh, the new windows will be clad in keeping with the secondary facade, side, in the back, fenestrations, trim, and detail. Uh, the new railings in the rear will include square painted balusters and a wood cap. And the roofing will be architectural asphalt uh, roofing on the slope portions and EPDM membrane roofing on the flat portions. Uh, the, board, uh, the prices uh, wish that the board would release the demo delay uh, so, so they can commence their um, construction. Thank you very much. Right, uh, thank you, Attorney Meade. Um, before I open, uh, so we will, we will have public comment in just a minute. So if you are an attendee and wish to make a public comment, again, you'll need to raise your hand so we can recognize you. Um, if one quick thing before we turn it over to that is to in uh, allow the me members of the board here if they have any specific questions for either the uh, uh, attorney Mead or the architect, anything that wasn't quite clear or anything you want to clear up, uh, you'd like to ask? I was, I, I'm trying to figure out the roof on the second floor. Is that, uh, is that just a low pitched, uh, yeah. On the addition oh, I see. Okay, good, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is not a flat roof. So that's what I was saying before. They're low pitched and therefore the, the perspective make, makes them look like they're flat. They're clearly all pitched roofs there. Okay, good, good. Okay, thank you. Do okay. we know when the pergola was installed? Uh, prior to my client's um, purchase of it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Let me see if I can get an answer to that while you ask the question. It is pressure treated, but it's it's clearly been there for quite some time. It's it's not in great shape, uh, and there's a very very old grapevine that's that's uh, attached to it. But it's uh, yeah, so it's. <laughs> I was wondering what that was. It was a, I thought maybe it was a wisteria or something. Yeah, no, it's a grape arbor. Is okay. there any plan huh. to preserve that? Is there any plan to preserve that grapevine? 
and actually one of my, my, my master's degrees in landscape architecture is so always asked that question on this one as well. It doesn't seem likely that we could preserve it, but uh, certainly they are uh, looking for some, you know, uh, additional garden plants and that type of thing out back. But the, uh, mm -hmm. the grape itself cannot be, cannot survive this. And what is the material that the banister going to be made of? Uh, the balusters are going to be, they're painted wood. Thank you. And there, there are balusters out front. So the idea is that we're going to be in keeping with that. I mean, obviously, the, if you look at the front elevation on the lower left, um, it's far too low to meet code. But the idea is that it's going to be in keeping with that same uh, you know, proportion in detail. Yeah, that's just a, almost a decorative railing out exactly. on the middle. Uh, yeah, on, yep. by the, right in the middle there. So there, there, will, there will be detail on the balusters in back. Uh, well, uh, they won't just be straight, straight two by twos. I think we're planning on, on straight uh, as, uh, five quarter by five quarter back there, but the 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 posts and, and, and rails were the idea was to keep it in uh, in keeping with the front. It probably won't be an exact replica though. Okay, any other questions from you guys? If not, let's see if we have some hands raised here. Is there a member of the public who wishes to make a comment? And while I'm waiting for that, I will note that there was an abutter on the, across the backyard on Temple Street that expressed concern. Well, there was a one technical matter about, uh, Ms. Me, did you happen to see that letter for, or was as an email from, from the abutter yes. there? Thank okay. You. So, yeah, we, yeah. So we corrected the plans, Mr. Okay. Richard. Um, you, the plans that you see on this presentation tonight uh, were the corrected plan with that map and lot number. Um, okay. And those were submitted uh, the day after that comment was received. Uh, in addition, um, my clients have spoken to uh, the neighbor and um, because there was a bit of a misunderstanding of what was actually proposed. Dare I ask what the result of that discussion was? I believe that um, I saw this woman, I saw Diana's name here, so perhaps she's here and maybe- oh, yeah. For herself. Yep. Uh, very good. And she has a hand up. So, Caitlin, can you enable um, audio? It looks like it already is. So, Diana, uh, did you want to make a comment? Um. Yes. I just, uh, just for housekeeping, the plot plan that was revised is still incorrect. It doesn't. It's not. Um. It doesn't involve me. But if you look at the plot plan, um it's uh where it should be hall in moscow it says 32-34 um 15 it should be it, it's it's not the condos that's actually hall in moscow so that plot plan is still wrong um well, it's an hour formally, though, uh, Mr. Chair. I mean, this, Ed, Ed Dixon's pretty reliable. I, I will have, I will go back to Ed. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we'll make sure the planning office has a proper plan. Um, okay, sure. Right, because but, it had us as like uh, Hall and Moscow as one, and we're two separate properties here. Right, that's been corrected. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, but then there, that's wrong. But I just wanted to mention just a couple of things just to uh consider so you know what it's already a pretty large building and so now we're going to add more and it is from 1810 and i just love these old homes i just had the history done on my home and my house is from 1784 it, it has quite a history all of these houses so it just it gets me i i get a little nervous when i know something is going to be changed and it actually can be seen from the street because when you go to the, um, the Mass Cultural Resource page, just even on that page, you can see the back. Mm -hmm. um, so you, it is gonna be noticeable and it's gonna be, it's definitely gonna affect, it, it's definitely gonna affect my yard because it's coming toward me, but it's already a really big house. It has 26, 73 square feet. And all the immediate abutters, where you know, um, 35 Prospect has a thousand square feet, 41 Prospect has 1,900 square feet, I have 1,288 square feet, and 40 Temple has 1,165 square feet. So 
now we're adding more on a house that already has five bedrooms and three bathrooms. <laughs> so that's concerning to me, not to mention there's a roof line change. There's another deck being added. We have the addition and then an addition above. I, I just, I'm just, I mean, I just am, you know, this Concerned. is definitely gonna affect us, all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we need to wrap it up. Uh, is there anything else important that you needed to add? No, no. I okay. just, you know, I, I, I love these old houses. It's from <laughs> that's Tower. clear. I just, I feel like you know, I just wish, I wish we wouldn't touch them. You know, I just think that well. they're just so beautiful, and when we add on, we mm -hmm. sometimes lose what originally was there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for your comment, uh, Diana. And don't forget to put your hand back down. Uh, anyone else in the attendee list here that wishes to make a comment? I'll give it just a couple seconds. If I don't see any hands, we'll close the comment, public comment. Oh, a hand just went up. Uh, I believe it's Ms. Uh, Niketish. Uh, did you wish to make a comment? I think your audio is now enabled. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Richards. So I just wanted to uh, uh, second the uh, the comments of, of Dia Butter. I think there were good comments. Um, I did note that uh, one of the concerns was removal of the chimney, and that was corrected in this presentation. But mm -hmm. a number of very good uh, comments, and I hope that the Historical Commission will uh, take them into account. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Last call. Anyone else on there? Going once, going twice. Don't see any hands. Okay. I will, I don't have a gavel to bang, but I'll close the public comment period and I'll turn it back over to my peers and colleagues for uh, discussion. Um, would anyone like to start the ball rolling? And as you know, if you're shy, I'm, I could very well call on you, so to speak, but I know I have something to say, but I'd like to hold off until you all have had a chance to opine or ask your questions or make your comments. Would anyone, anyone else have a comment on the board here? Pro, con, yes, no, like it, don't like it, changes? Just a point of clarification, if I may. Yeah, um, Peter, is that you? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, on the elevation uh, that we're looking at right now in the upper right, it shows um, a, a, a line of setback or what could be just a delineation between the original building and the proposed addition. Um, and I, I'm looking on my other screen here for the rendering that I saw that didn't show something like that, or maybe I just looked at it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, is there some sort of a setback there so that there is a distinction between the original structure and what's being proposed? And b before I ask for the answer, I'll, I'll comment that you've got a sharp eye. I noticed the same thing, Peter, and uh, there, there is a disagreement between those two. Um, and you've hit upon the one thing that, that kind of sticks with me on this, and, and that's making that rearwood extension wall flush or in the same plane with the side wall of the original house. I think it would be just as when they originally built back there, they set it back. It doesn't have to be set back that far. It only has, you know, sometimes six inches is all it takes to define the original historical structure from what's been added on. So anyway, but that, that was going to be kind of my main comment. So having said, and it would also reduce the visibility of that very uh, unfederal characteristic roof deck and so on. So having said that, I'll let either Mr. Tucker or Attorney Mead uh, make a response if you like. Actually, if I could just if I could just yep. uh, add on to my comment, um, sure. on the other side of the building as well, I have the same issue. And I recognize uh, that there's a challenge there because that, that window, which I think is above a, a tub or a sink in the master bath, um, is right in the path of where that line would be, but it's still the same sort of thing that just presents itself as just mm. this, this featureless void. So, um, if I could, Mr. Chair, so yeah. um, 
on this side of the structure, there's no, um, we're not taking away anything that exists there relative to a, a sideboard or a corner board or anything like that. So that it is what it is. Nobody's changing that footprint. Um, on the side that um, the renovation is occurring on, uh, there is a, um, it's funny because uh, Mr. Tucker and I had this conversation earlier today. Uh, the corner board uh, does go all the way down as you can see in this, the existing corner board does go all the way down uh, to separate the two in this existing elevation. And um, so it, there is a corner board there. It does not show on the rendering. You're absolutely correct, Peter. Um, it's not on the rendering. Um, but maybe Mr. Tucker, you can talk about the separation of the two and whether or not it could be stepped back any. Yeah, so, and I apologize on the rendering. Uh, those, the, the renderings don't allow us to get a lot of the detail that these uh, line drawings do allow. So we do clearly want to show a separation there in terms of the plane, but that you're correct that those are coplanar. In other words, the, the mm -hmm. addition on the right is in the same plane as the piece on the left. Uh, architecturally, I always like to step back a, you know, even if it, you know, go from one story to three stories there, I typically do like to actually have a, uh, a, a planometric step back. I want to show you in plan why we struggled with that though. Yeah, I don't Caitlin, can you that. show a plan, one of the plan views? Maybe I think it's a couple pages down from where okay, you there's are. There's 17 or 18, actually 18 is a better slide. So if you look yeah. there, there's a bathroom there that we're pretty tight on. I think it's four foot six deep. Uh, mm -hmm. We have looked at, at spots to put that bathroom. That seems to be the only practical place to, to not have it, you know, immediately off the dining room or immediately off the kitchen. Uh, and so that the, the bath as well as the, um, uh, the, the adjacent mudroom uh, are really kind of aligning with the existing exterior wall on the left. And then they've, they've created a flush condition on the right. Um, I would you know, venture to say that maybe a couple of inches, I don't think six inches is possible because at that point we've essentially negated the, the ability to use that space. Uh, mm -hmm. Less than that is, is something that we probably could do like, you know, two or three or something like that. I'm not sure if that's worth mm -hmm. doing, but it's um, you at least understand the reason why we did that. Okay, yeah. I, uh, when I was looking at this earlier, I was thinking <clears throat> move, you know, um, that coincident with moving that wall and you could move the interior wall in, but then I, I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking that that was an existing wall and right. in the kitchen, that would be kind of a, make a major change. Um, do you happen to know what the width of that corner board is by any chance? Uh, we were going to match the existing, I think it's four and a half, but I'm not positive. Yeah, four and a half would be pretty typical, I think. Hmm. What do you I, know? What? It, uh, yeah, go ahead. The um, if if the uh, the reasoning behind that, and that's that's what I figured when I saw the the, the plans. Um, that just trying to retain as much room in that in that powder room as possible. But if that's the sole purpose behind it, um, it it I I think the trade off of having those two building planes so close together uh, is not worth the generous space in that powder room. And for, uh, again, this is, this is a subjective measure, but um, I, would, I would prefer to see a narrower bathroom and they, the, it, it could be narrower by that amount it, and still be a very effective powder room. So that's, my preference would be to see more of a setback. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are close to code minimum. I, I, I agree with you that, that uh, especially in historic homes, that we're able to create very tiny bathrooms. Yep. Uh, for a modern bathroom, I am required to have 22 inches in front of the toilet. I'm getting fairly close to it. Um, my, and by the way, architecturally, as, as if, if this is purely an architectural exercise, I, I too would love to see that step back. I'm, I'm squeezed again against that uh, existing wall. And just to make clear of why we're keeping the existing wall is that directly below that is our foundation, right? So that's doing a lot of the, 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 the heavy oh, thing for us. Um, otherwise, so I would just say we can move a wall. But, um, is it a load bearing wall? That is a load bearing wall. Yes. Okay. So colleagues, anyone else want to weigh in on this? And, and while, we, while we're weighing in, uh, have you tried to figure out, you know, more exactly, Mr. Tucker, about you know how many inches you think you could squeeze out of that? I bet I could get, uh, it'd be great if I could get a full corner board. Like if I could get four and a half there and just get mm -hmm. the corner board to return on itself and then hit the siding on the next run, I think right. that would be great. And if it's, um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, you know, I, I'm going back and forth. I don't want to squeeze it too much that I, right. that I 
uh, making an illegal bath. Yeah, and that, and that would probably be enough to, as for well, for me personally, that would be enough to right. do it because that would give that corner a nice def defining cutoff. And it, right. You know, and it, and it is a narrow space there, so it's not like, you know, it's uh, on a corner where it's going to going to get a, a wide angle view, so to speak. It's sure. like a tight angle. So that would probably be enough. I don't know if Peter agrees or not, but what do you other guys think? You know, uh, Joe, um, uh, Malcolm, Chris, Patricia, any other? Oh, Patricia, you've got a hand up. What did you want to say? I was going to say stepping that addition in that much would also bring the railing of the roof deck in a little bit for those yep. of us who don't love <laughs> when such structures are, are visible from a public way, maybe just a little few more inches would make a difference on that too. Yeah, that was I one think of, we could that, work that. Yep. That was one of my thoughts too. In fact, if it if for some reason it was impossible, it's gonna say just just um moving that railing in, you know, a little bit just so sure. it's not quite so obvious. But yeah, I'm getting I'm getting a sense of uh semi consensus here. Um no, I think, Mr. Chair, I think yep. that Mr. Tucker is saying we can uh, we can do the four and a half inches and yep. uh, return that corner board on that back base. Correct. Okay, that looks doable. Okay. And um, Chris has his hand up, Glenn. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Fay, speak. Yeah. Uh, I would concur. And then I'm just looking at that last drawing, slide 21, and it just appears that that the roof on top of the proposed first floor uh change is it is it hanging over a little bit roof on top of uh yes there, there is a slight overhang similar to what is on the main roof so that that would mean that would extend out beyond oh i'm sorry you're talking about the one story piece that actually should be flush we, we would actually pull that back and be flush that's what i just wanted to see so yeah. it appears that the the extension is flush the the railing is flush but there, it just looks like it's hanging over and therefore extending out a little bit yeah, what we would do is it would just be the depth of two pieces of trim coming across there. So it would be, you know, an inch and a half of, a, of an overhang instead yeah. of what's shown there. Yes. I if feel we're, more comfortable with if it stepped in just yep. for my two cents. Yeah, so that would help in that area too, Mr. Tucker, right? We're looking at, I'm looking at the lower right. That's the rear of the, yes. of the house. So if that was, you know, if, if we, if that was now flush with the, the inside edge of the corner board, that will, you know, also help you out as far as, you know, that little, Eve overhang and and the railing and all that other good stuff. Correct. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're not really surprised to hear us bringing this up. No, I live in Marblehead. We deal with the same thing. So it's uh, yeah. You know, welcome criticism. Yep. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Um, well, uh, then why don't we uh, have a a, uh, a motion? Um, the uh, someone else feels ready. If not, maybe can try to, to craft one. Um, I would propose the following motion that the uh, board uh, is willing to uh, approve uh, release for, for demo permit and building permit with the um, condition that that uh, rear, you know, one story addition there be brought in uh, the four and a half inches discussed uh, rather than be coplanar with the, the front part. Uh, but before I make that, finally make that motion, was there any other important, you know, I know, Peter, you had some other concerns on the other side and stuff. Would, did you have any other, you know, sticking points or would that, would that be good for you? I suppose it would be good for me. Uh, Attorney Mead points out that they're not doing anything on the other side where the, that same problem exists. Yeah. Right. Um, it's an existing and, condition there. Yeah, yeah. so um, it's a shame, but. Yeah, well, technically they're doing something, but nothing related to that. They're making that double window slightly bigger, but that's about it. It, it, is, it is a one big sweep as it is now. All right, well, then I'll formally make that motion that we uh, grant the okay to go ahead with the con on the proviso or with the condition that that uh, addition be stepped in on the uh, I'll call it the right hand, I'm not sure which direction I face, I guess eastern facing side there, that facade be brought in uh, to the interior edge of the of the corner board there. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second it. Okay, I think that was Malcolm? Yes. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. So I'll go through my roll here. 
Um, so Malcolm, you're, I'm, I do these in alphabetical order, order and since you're Carnwath here first, so what's, what's your vote on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mark Centron? Yes. Okay. Chris Fay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, Peter McNamee? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Joe Morgan? Yes. Okay. Patricia Pecknick? Yes. Okay. And the chair is going to vote yes on that as well. Uh, so I'll, so Attorney Mead, I will uh, communicate with the planning office, although Caitlin is on the call, so she's hearing all this, that, um, but I will report back to them that uh, we've approved that motion to uh, not impose a demo delay, but uh, pr allow the project to move forward with the condition we discussed. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Sure. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple items. That was the only item that had a public hearing. We have a couple other interesting items here. Uh, as you know, it's, it's, uh, it's neither duck nor rabbit season. It's CPC application season. So we have a couple more people wanting to present projects uh, to us here. Uh, the first one we'll take up is from the Newport Parks Department. I believe uh, Ms. Kimberly Turner, are you talking to that? Um, actually, Chuck Griffin is going to start out the presentation. I'm oh, going to okay. take it from him. So are you, let me, uh, Claire, I wasn't clear if one was talking to one application and the, and the others the other. I know, I, uh, is the Parks Department doing bo um, both the, uh, yeah, I thought there were two. I just see the-, the There are two applications, but we're going to um, combine them in our um, talk tonight. Oh, okay. It was the um, frog pond and then it was the, the fountain or something or- Correct. Okay. All right. Why don't you, all right, so you can go in any order you want. You, let's see. I think you're both enabled, right? Let's see. Yeah. You both have talking enabled. So whoever wants to speak, whether it's Chuck or, okay. Kim, or Kim, you can go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You want to go in the next slide? Uh, When the founders came here, we're going to go back to basics because uh, Bartlett Mall is that old, Frog Pond is that old. So they came through in 1635, landed here. Next slide. By the way, Mr. Griffin, uh, Caitlin assured me that you guys would try to be brief. Because <laughs> yes. I know you've got a lot of slides. <laughs> but God, sorry, uh, go ahead. I can do them in 10 seconds each if I don't have to. In any okay. case, here you see in 1640 the path that went up to the existing uh, town and there's only four places noted and only two still exist. So of all the places we have from the settlers, uh, Frog Pond is the only one that still exists uh, in Newburyport. Next. And so when we go back to uh, the early writings in the newspapers, you can see uh, in the next slide, this is the point I just made, it's the only place. Here's 1766, the first drawing of Frog, Frog Pond, and it was an industrial period. Uh, at that time, there was industry done here uh, from uh, 1650 clear up to 1800 when it pretty much stopped. Next. First drawings of Newburyport, very first uh, plan we have. You see Frog Pond in the foreground with livestock in the pond, the rope walk. So this is the industrial period. Next, the cow and so, grazing in there, taking a yes, swim. <laughs> yes, and you can see the banks were the way I'm treated. Anyhow, the industrial commons had these eight elements. Mm -hmm. Next, and as time goes on, we saw the uh, town move to its present site after ten years at its Parker River site. And each time you see at the arrow, there's a frog pond again. It's always in the center of things. It's always a center of attraction because it was the commons. Mm -hmm. uh, next. So Tracy was the first one to uh, improve the place. And here you see in 1779, he plants trees where the rope walk stood, which is parallel to High Street. Next comment by the local newspaper. I'll let you read it about Bartlett. Mm. Next. So here you have in, in 1801 or so, the town uh, 
talking about how what a wonderful place Bart Laval can be if some time and energy was spent on it. Next. The first documents that are in the paper signed by Greenleaf and all the boys you recognize the names on the right hand side, I'm sure. Here they're talking about roads. When the two towns split, uh, Newburyport just took over the Mal area and New Newbury complained about it. They went to court over it, but New Report just kept acting like it was theirs and eventually bought them out. Next. So on the maps later, you can see the courthouse at the head of Green Street, and there's a school building at each end. And the house is on Pond Street. Next. This is a very rare picture because it's actually dated on the back by Mosley, but here's the courthouse entering the water very uh, narrowly, the little bit of earth around it, jail in the distance on the left, and the skating scene like we have today. 18, uh, you can see the date. Uh, next. Also before, uh, there's one of the schools, we're down at the beach, and I found out today the first time that the the walk was connected at the upper, upper levels, 1854. Next. So there you have the school building. The last one to come down is on the right. And in the center on the left, you see the buildings, the barn and the big houses that were adjacent to Pond Street that were then uh, purchased and, and made available. Uh, next. So those were on those houses were on the side of Pond Street. That's the mall side, right? Not the other. Yes. Okay. Yes. You can see here the big house that's facing us with the two chimneys that's facing the pond hmm. across the street from it. It's in shadow there and dark. That building still exists hmm. uh, right next to CVS. Okay. Uh, but that these big buildings are removed. Right. Uh, next. So here is a Herald is uh, asking people to take a look at this. It became a dumpy area, pretty bad. There was a lawsuit that came up through it that's in the documents. But uh, he's pointing out that it's so beautiful, it'd be an ornament in any city in the country. Next. It's about the last written piece, I promise. But you can see here, this is the fundraising letter from the Mal Improvement Association. Uh, <laughs> back at the time. And they're the ones that really cleaned it all up. Next. I like that word mortification. Yes. Uh, so here you have the association again, talking about uh, how beautiful it could be. Next, please. And then uh, we we're very fortunate um, when he was on his own, the great uh, landscape architect, uh, Charles Elliott came, he had a family member in the city and donated his services. Uh, next. And he presented this plan in 1887. We still have the originals of the plan and giving his ideas for how this could lay out. He changed very little of what was done, uh, but he realigned uh, the lower left coming up that Y-shaped piece and at the upper right, he has the two sloping areas that slope down to the pond. Those are all Elliot, as is some of the other detailing. Next. And this is his letter, first letter to the town, the ancient commons, and he's writing this in 1887. Next. And this is the work they did. This is photograph was taken uh, just after the work was done in 1889, this is about uh, 1890. You can see the spacing of the trees around the edge, the highly controlled aspect of it, uh, quite different than today, but we have some of the shapes remaining. Next. You can see here the beauty that we actually have the date on this picture. You can see the great accuracy with which the work was done, the great care. And it was all done by man and animal muscle. Right. Next. There again, the tree spacing, the edge of the pond was never really clarified. And it was complained about, about by Charles Elliott and others that this was a problem, that it should have a constant height and should have water added and taken away as all other municipal uh, 
water uh, parks do. Next. The fountain then was brought Edward Mosley who gave the land for the back of the library. He ran two banks in town. He was probably the most generous person we've ever had in the city, he gave the fountain. And he, that came in about uh, three years after the rest of the work was done. Next. This is what the man looks like. It's, this picture's down at our library. Next. So what, where we are today, to get to the CPC request, this fountain is in tough shape. It hasn't run for uh, many years, maybe eight or so. And the steel is deter iron is deteriorating. And what we're asking for is the money to fix it, $126,000 uh, to be done by Cassidy Brothers and Rowley, a uh, nationally famous firm for doing this sort of work. It's a rare item to have an iron fountain in a pond, a very rare item even in Massachusetts. So they would take this material, take it apart. It comes in about eight sections and take it to their place, clean all the, the junk off of it and do a four step process. Some of that is in the application folder. I won't bore you with it. And then uh, bring it back. Um, next. Shows it close up the condition it is. It's uh, gray iron. It's trying to return. If you remember your chemistry, Fe two O three is <laughs> iron. It's trying to return to rust. The new uh, the new materials that go on this, it ends up with a urethane finish. It's the same finish the Navy puts on its ships, and it's supposed to last fifty or more years. And what it really does is encapsulate the iron so the air doesn't get to it and deteriorate it. Next. It'll, the issue will come up. We haven't addressed this yet. We'll have a meeting on it in the future so anyone that cares can come. We have the original uh, uh, fountain decoration on the left, which still can be purchased. And on the right is the one that a local artist did, Jeff Briggs. Next. Uh, that's Jeff with the mock-up of the fountain. He donated this work in 1889. It was installed uh, next. He's quite a famous man. If you know about Boston, this is the Greenway Carousel, the national uh, reputation. Tiffany Park is there. Jeff said so, every... I'm sorry, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the new, the fiberglass one is 1889? He means 1989. No, sorry. Uh, okay. No, 1989. I'm sorry. I'm looking at a cell phone. It's so hard to see the dates. Oh, um, okay. No problem. Any case, yeah, any case, Jeff did this, and all these animals are his work, all the sounding boards, all the art on this. He's a remarkable uh, local artist. Uh, in Japan, they'd call him a national treasure. Next. So on the fountain, you can see there it calls out what the what we're wanting to have done, and the request is one hundred twenty six thousand dollars. Next. So the next thing I'll speak to is, we, and Kim will get in, we'll get into this much more than I, but we're looking to establish a constant height water on the pond, and it needs to have an edge, granite edge that goes around the pond. And we're, what we're asking for now is 25% of the perimeter, the monies to do that. Uh, we've taken uh, prices from eight quarries, eight different suppliers, picked one to, uh, symbolically at least to make this application. So that's $132,023 to achieve that edge. And we wanna do it because we're convinced that if we allow people to put their names on blocks of stone, uh, which is rare for Bartlett Mall. It's been resisted from the beginning. There's almost no memorials in Bartlett Mall, very different than Atkinson Common. And a lot of us involved with it like it that way, so you're not bothered by uh, messages. But in any case, this is a way to raise money so we would be able to, to we believe if we had some of this, that we could dedicate this, this uh, amount of money could bring a lot more money forth, we believe. In addition, we need a memorial to uh, a, mon a place to be able to put down some of this information to show the public 
what this place was and is and who built it. And we could do that on these blocks of granite. And so we could have a corporate memory, which is lost on this project about every uh, 10 years or 20 years, it's forgotten and it deteriorates further. Next. And so you see now that the problem, uh, we don't have a constant height water. This is there on the left is the along Pond Street. You can see that it's flooded there. This occurs a, a very much all year round. You cannot walk this low, lower area. And the next slide, please. And it also creates havoc with the hillsides. This, these hills were all hand formed uh, all those many years ago. And here they're just deteriorating with water coming right up to it. This should be a walkway with a granite edging and lit at night. It could be glorious and we could be taking care of what our forefathers gave us. Next. And here's at the bottom of that chair. You can see forward is uh, Pond Street. This gets into our next subject. This needs to be edged, but it also gets into your talk, Kim. Next. Great, thanks Chuck, I'll take it from here. Um, so thanks you all, everyone for um, taking some time to listen to us tonight. I only have about five slides left. So um, I'm the chair of the Parks Commission. Chuck is a Parks Commissioner alongside with me and this has been sort of our, our baby for the last seven or so years since I've joined the Parks Commission. Um, just a gist of, of what Chuck just finished saying, you know, the Bartlett Mel Frog Pond is a kettle hole. It's been there for 11,000 years. Um, but it's a highly engineered pond. Um, as Chuck mentioned before, uh, when the courthouse was installed in 1805, the promenade, the uh, raised elevated walkway along High Street was put in. And what that did is it cut off a ravine from Green Street. So a fresh water supply from that ravine was cut off. And what's important to note is that by cutting off the fresh water supply from the surface, the Bartlett Mal Frog Pond has actually been an issue for the city for over 200 years. Um, there's numerous articles that state that it started to smell. It was, as Chuck said, a kind of a junky site for a while. And the city ever since has been trying to find a way to restore it back to its original glory. Um, this photo here should alarm anyone who sees it. This pea <laughs> soup green color is not um, a, a problem with your monitor. This is an actual aerial photograph that was taken just a few years ago. We have had numerous toxic algae blooms um, occurring pretty, par um, pretty frequently in the pond, and it's really a critical time now that we need to deal with this. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, so Chuck had already, has already mentioned one of our CPC applications is to uh, restore the fountain and, and that will help because that will help to continue to aerate the pond. Um, but the reason that the fountain has been turned off for so many years is that the water quality itself is deteriorating the fountain. So we need to deal with the problem of cleaning up the water quality now. And so our second CPC application is asking for three things. Um, one is to start to help to quantify the problem. So what we're gonna try to do is get a bathymetric survey done, which is a topographic survey of the bottom of the, of the pond extending out 30 feet from the edge, which will help us in um, uh, putting together a feasibility study for, for what our options are. That said, we think we know what the solution is here. Um, and speaking with numerous wetland scientists, uh, we sort of have three options. One is to, plat uh, one is to plant cattails. Um, periodically, year after year, that will start to suck up some of the toxic material in the pond and then harvest them annually. I think that will literally take the next 100 years and I don't have the, uh, the patience to deal with that. So I'm looking for a, a, a solution that's a little bit um, quicker acting. Uh, the second option was to dredge the pond, which was actually in a report that we received back in uh, 2014. That is an extremely expensive solution that not only um, I think is gonna be cost prohibitive for the city, but it also creates in a situation where you're, you're kind of passing on this toxic material to somebody else to deal with because it would have to be shipped out of state and put into a landfill. So we really don't think that's a feasible solution either. The third <laughs> solution, which is the one that we're exploring right now is encapsulation. So what we wanna try to do is prevent the impurities and the toxic substances that are in the muck right now from continuously um, uh, in intersecting with the water column. Um, and in order to do that, we 
we believe there is a solution where we can um, we can put a liner on the bottom of the pond and then cover that liner with clay and sand that will support aquatic um, plants and wildlife once again. Um, in order to do that, uh, we again need the bathymetric survey to give some information about what's happening in the bottom of the pond. Um, we've also asked for uh, dollars to pay for two, the digging of two shallow wells, which will help to bring fresh water into the pond. Um, and then thirdly is the acquisition of the stone, which Chuck had, had uh, described earlier, which will help um, stabilize the soil's edge and the pond's edge so that we can keep it at a consistent level. You can just quickly show the next two slides, which give the actual dollar amounts that we are asking for. So again, this the two wells um, we believe will be around forty thousand dollars. And the next slide is the bathymetric survey, um, which is thirteen thousand eight hundred and twelve dollars. So next slide. That's the end of our conversation. Um, I'd love to take questions if anyone has any. Hopefully, that gives you a good overview of what we're asking for. And, and again, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kim and, and Chuck for that. Um, I have a slight advantage over some of my colleagues here in that as a representative on the CPC, we had a meeting just last night. So, and I had a chance to look over your materials. Um, <clears throat> so I'm somewhat familiar with with uh, what, what they ask is here. And um, uh, I did have a couple of real quick questions. I, uh, a bit of history, I seem to recall Relatively recently, a few years ago, there was an experimental attempt to try to uh, clear the water. They had something set up uh, over in the vicinity of the courthouse and so on. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Well, that was a that was a pilot project that mm -hmm. a few years ago, the city opted to, to give a try. It was a reverse osmosis system. So if, uh, if you remember your science class, um, you know, it, the, the thinking was it would take the toxic material out of the water. Uh -huh. And um, just by a natural current, allow the fresh water to um, to remain. And the problem with the science on that is that there is such, I believe it's somewhere around the vicinity of 12 to 13 tons of uh, phosphorus in the muck beneath the water uh -huh. that it would just it was just too much for a reverse osmosis system to take care of. So so it, you know it, that was grant funded. I think it was seventy thousand um, dollars. Mm -hmm. it, it was a, a clean water uh, grant fund that that the city was awarded, um, but it just didn't work. Right. So okay. So yeah, it's just overwhelmed. And you mentioned how the the wells would uh, pr prevent the water level from getting too low. What if there's a heavy rain and it gets too high? Is there also a mechanism f to avoid? Like Chuck showed some slides with flooding and that sort of thing. Yes. Is there also a solution for that? Yeah. So we're exploring that right now. And as a matter of fact, I just today, um, over the last couple of days, have been having conversations with uh, John Eric White, or the city engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and we believe uh, he has he has determined, he has historical documents that there is a valve box in the uh, in the park. Um, because historically this pond was used for fire suppression. Um, and he has actually visited the cisterns in the south end that still some of them still exist, um, mm -hmm. that they would release this valve and the water would would drop down. I see. So we we're still again, part of this is in the exploratory stages, um, but we do believe it, it, you know, either the, the gate, the valve will work to help us, you know, regulate the water level. If not, um, we will design huh. a uh, kind of an overflow system to, to yeah. prevent the, the washout of the slopes that like, like Chuck had mentioned earlier. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask my colleagues on the board. I see a hand up Patricia Pecknick. Would you like to make a ask a question or make a comment? A couple of quick, quick questions, but thank you for the excellent presentation. I, I could listen to this stuff all day. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. I remember when my daughter was at the Kelly School and the Frog Pond mm. was their science class. And it's been very sad to see over the years with Yankee Homecoming that we can't go out in the boats and tip over anymore. And, <laughs> you know, it's been sad to lose the kind of winters where we were, we were skating there all the time. Yeah, but I'd forgotten about those. Yeah. My question, I, I, I don't understand what happened to the original swan. What happened to the original swan? And then it was replaced in 1989 with this new 
what happened? Sure, yeah, I, I can speak to that as well. So the original Swan um, was installed, what, what is it, 1887, I believe, Chuck? Oh, the Heron, okay. Or, yeah, it, yeah it. and it, it's it's actually, it, they, it was called the Tennessee Heron. It came out of the Fisk Company catalog out of New York. Um, it was, as far as we can tell, randomly selected from a catalog back then. I mean, it was a big to-do. There were lots of newspaper articles about this thing coming down the railroad and showing up at the park. It was a wonderful story. Um, it completely disintegrated. And then for, as far as I can understand, in the late um, 1980, early 1980s, um, a, an ice storm finally did it in. So oh, it, it's, okay. it's okay. completely, it's completely gone. Um, when Chuck mentioned, you know, we can purchase it again, you know, there are um, molds of this Fisk company sculpture that, you know, we could in theory recreate it. But again, it didn't really have any historical connection to I New York it. per se. Yeah. Um, so when, when Jeffrey Briggs donated his services to create this triple swan sculpture, there were two reasons for him to do that. One was he was trying to increase the aeration to the mm -hmm. pond. So the swans have three sources of water coming out mm -hmm. rather than the single source from the heron sculpture. So it was a little bit of engineering on his part to come up with a way to increase the aeration to the pond. Um, and, you know, again, he's a local artist. So while swans themselves may not be directly connected to Newburyport, the artist is. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's so fantastic. Thank you. And can I just ask for reassurance? And I think I got the reassurance from Mr. Griffin already, but um, the names of the donors will not be engraved in the granite blocks that rim the pond, will they? We haven't, we need to discuss that with the Parks Commission right now. We had thought it, that would might be a way to um, bring revenue in to help with the fundraising for this project, but it's not something that, um, you know, the, the blocks themselves we've discussed, but what's going to be engraved on them has not been vetted through the Parks Commission quite yet. Okay. Uh, I, okay. Yeah, I see. I, I thought maybe Mr. Griffin had already indicated that they would be somewhere, but not necessarily um in that okay i get it though it's fundraising and you have to motivate people and yeah okay mrs uh, mark central I, I see uh, your hand up did you want to yeah thank you for a very interesting uh, historical review of the bartlett mall um i had a quick question regarding the uh, the toxic contents mm -hmm. of the bottom of the, uh, the pond you mentioned phosphorus. What are the other concerns, and and um, is this really truly manageable using this sort of uh, uh, insulating uh, technique? Um, so I'm really curious to know what what the big uh, concern is regarding the, the toxicity. Of sure. Yeah. So I, I can definitely speak to that. So we had, again, in 2014, we had a um, extensive report done by a local civil engineer who took um, test, um, you know, dug test holes in here and, and was able to quantify uh, the toxins. So beneath the, the muck and peat layer is subsoil. And in that subsoil, there is arsenic, chromium, and lead. Um, and that's fairly common for these uh, historic industrial sites. So you, as you recall, Chuck's slide, there was rope making. This was a training ground for militia before the Revolutionary War. There's been a lot of an industry um, and just, you know, legacy pollution that occurred here. So that's in the very base layer. So, so um, heavy metals in the, in the base layer. Then there's a thin layer of peat, which is just compressed muck. Um, which in itself is not toxic. The muck layer is about three to three and a half feet thick. It's quite thick. And what happens with the muck is you get a tremendous amount of phosphorus in it um, just from, you know, runoff historically from fertilizers and whatnot, which we, I, I wanna note now are, are not using any chemicals in the park anymore. Um, that is a policy that the Parks Commission voted on uh, a few years ago. Um, but we also have cyanobacteria, which is a naturally occurring um, bacteria. And when you have situations like this, where really the only outlet is evaporation, that concentration of cyanobacteria increases tremendously. Um, and so that's what we're trying to prevent from circulating into the water column again. And the encapsulation 
again, it, it's sort of an, an impervious uh, protector between the muck and the water, and it will prevent the mixing of the cyanobacteria um, and any other toxins that could be present um, from getting into the water. If, does, that, does that help answer your question? Yeah, it does. I appreciate that. And I also wanted to know about the, the sort of the vegetation. Does the vegetation interact with the, with the, the phosphorus or the toxins that are there? And, and what are the plans to deal with the vegetation? So all of the material will be dealt with that we have to take out will be dealt with, um, will have to be dealt with. Actually, I'm not sure about the plants, if they'll have to be dealt with as a toxic material or not. That's a good question. I know in 2004 and 2005, there was a notice of intent for the Bartlett Mel because there was an inundation of um, invasive plant material, and that was removed in the early 2000s. It was before my time on the commission. Um, so I, I, I believe the plant, the invasive plants, are not nearly what they have historically been. So I don't believe there's gonna be an awful lot of plant material that will need to be removed. Um, but there definitely was a concern back then that there were invasive pond lilies and phragmites and other, other plants that uh, were sort of contributing to the decline of the pond. Um, this is Glenn, uh, Kim, the, um, and I think, uh, well, you said the barrier, the impervious barrier would be between the muck and the nasty stuff below. How do you get it underneath three feet of muck? Yeah, so that's a good question too. So there's admixtures you can add to the muck, um, things like lime, um, uh, benzenite and other, other things you can add to the muck that will actually stabilize it and it will um, it will bind with the toxins and, and make them, you know, sort of inert, I guess. Um, so I think the intention here is, and again, we're still in the sort of feasibility right. study for the actual liner itself. That has nothing to do with the CPC funds we're asking for right oh, now. Sure. Those are sort of outside of the, the realm of the liner because we are still gathering data on that right now. Okay. Um, but my, my understanding is the way we're gonna um, you know, approach this problem is we will dewater the pond, we'll um, sort of, sculpts the bottom of it a, a slightly so that we have um, a section that's deeper to support aquatic wildlife um, for overwintering of fish and, and frogs and turtles and that sort of a thing. Um, and we will combine some of the muck with a stabilizing element before the, uh, the, the liner is, is applied. Uh, one, one uh, Glenn, yes. uh, an, an additional point, it's also thought that on top of the liner, is uh, roughly a foot of a blend of clay and sand. It holds the liner down. Right. And, and then the liner comes out to the edge of the pond and it goes underneath the granite edging. Right. And uh, so there's, the liner just isn't allowed to float. It would actually, right. with uh, yeah. methane, it would float. <laughs> and and uh, you mentioned that, I'm glad you brought up the granite again. Did, did I hear you correctly, Chuck, that it, you are only getting funding or asking for funding that would do about 25% or about a quarter of the perimeter? Yes. Okay. With, with okay. the prices I have now, that's the truth. We would be using Deer Isle granite, and uh -huh. that would get us about a quarter of the way around if we use Deer Isle. I'm in conversations with uh, other quarries to try to beat that price. Uh, may have success. Okay, and is the plan ultimately to hope at someday in the future do the whole thing or or do you see parts of it being sort of beach like the way they are now? I think we see uh, a half to a quarter of it being beach, quite frankly, mm -hmm. because we want to um, allow access eventually. And one thing Chuck and I have not noted yet, which isn't part of this application either, is that um, you know, it's been my dream, at least for the last seven years, to um, bring some uh, boating activity, paddle boating activity mm -hmm. back into the pond eventually. Mm -hmm. So we're going to want to have, um, you know, some access to, right. to be able to get into the boats. Swan boats. Joe, I see your hand is up. Do you want to say something? Mr. Morgan? Where'd you go? Oh, your video just disappeared, Joe. Did you go? Did you disappear? Did you hit the wrong button? 
Hmm. I think he's frozen. I, he, I've got his picture still. Hmm. Yeah, his picture went black for me. All right. Well, hopefully he'll be he'll rejoin us momentarily. I hope. Oh, there you're back. I see you, you again, me? Joe. You now, now we hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if if so. There's some discrete uh, requests here for different parts of this project, but it sounds like. The overall scope is much larger than just what's uh, being asked for here of uh, by, for uh, CPA funding. And I'm wondering, is there a, you know, is there is there a project spreadsheet for for total project cost on this? What do we know about the the full cost of? Yeah, we're we're working on that right now. As I said, we we have a feasibility study going right now. I, I'm actually was able, um, hopefully, to secure. Um, the same team that's working on the Boston Garden Lagoon right now, where the swan boats in Boston are, um, they're having similar issues as the Bartlett Mall. And um, professionally, I'm a landscape architect, so I was able to kind of tap into some professional resources and was able, I'm hoping, to compile the same team that's working in Boston to work here as well. Um, and they are, with any luck, going to be putting together a feasibility study to start adding some real cost um, numbers to, uh, you know, to this liner project. So we'll have a better understanding of the the comprehensive um, the project. Yeah. But when you have full, when you have full, excuse me, when you have full project cost, will that impact any of these numbers or any of this scope that you're proposing? No, it's no. it's our understanding that regardless of what the liner design specifically is we are still going to need uh, a stabilizing edge, a bathymetric survey for sure, um, and a water source. So um, we see this as only being contributory to the greater project. Yeah, Thank would it be you. fair to say, Kim, that this is pretty much, this is quite a long-term, I imagine you foresee this taking some years to Bring to full fruition. Not if I have my way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. I like the optimism. And and j just for again to Joe's uh, partially to help answer this question, Joe. Right now there are two specific, excuse me, two specific asks or, or requests or applications with the CPC. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, either Chuck or Kim. One is specifically just for the fountain restoration, and the other is for that survey she just mentioned and the wells. I'm not sure what else, but but that's that's what's being asked for, for the for this cycle that we're the CPC is correct. In this year. Right. One one of the applications is just for the fountain restoration. And the other one is for the bathymetric survey, the two shallow wells, and acquisition of a part of the edging stone. Right, the edging stone. Right, I forgot about that. Yeah, and I think I would echo. Uh, I had similar concern that uh, Ms. Becknick mentioned about, you know, uh, the, the names. That, you know, it, sometimes it sounds like a good idea, but I can easily see that running into problems, especially if you know. Like I was, my wife and I took a walk on one of the boardwalks and this particular boardwalk, they must have had a scheme like that where you could, you know, buy a board. So there were boards and sometimes they were like in memory of so-and-so or they were, you know, just funky sayings or God knows, you know, anything, whatever the person wanted to put on it. So um, I could foresee there being concerns about that aspect of things. Noted. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other comments from the board or questions? So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chuck or Kim. You, what you would like to see is um, the uh, NHC uh, kind of get on board, so to speak, with uh, supporting your applications. We would love that. Yes, certainly. Okay, and. Um, all right, so why don't we, would someone like to make a motion to that effect? Uh, they could be done separately, you know, the fountain and, and the other thing, or it could be done, you know, the two could be combined into one motion if people, if someone feels so inclined, would someone care to venture one? Oh, come on, don't be shy, don't be bashful. I don't know about you guys. You know, chair isn't supposed to make all the motions. I'll make a motion that we support the both projects. That was Mr. So Fay, Christopher Fay, correct? Yes. Okay, is there a second? I second. Okay, thank you. 
Ms. Pecknick. A uh, motion has been made that to uh, what this would mean in practicality and see, of course, Chris and, and Patricia, see if you agree, what that would mean in practical terms is that uh, I would draft a brief letter that could be that uh, the applicants could could submit to the CPC saying that the NHC um, supports, you know, th thinks they have a worthy cause here and that we, we support their application, you know, to that effect. But given, you know, what we would cite is the fact that, and I think uh, Mr. Griffin did an admirable job of presenting uh, the history of uh, Frog Pond and uh, to, to say that it's an important historic aspect of our little city is almost an understatement. So, uh, so that's the kind of, that's what, that's what the end result of, uh, of a successful motion here would mean. Okay, so without further ado, I'll go around the board here. Uh, Malcolm Conrath, uh, vote on this. You didn't lose your, oh, I see. Malcolm's screen is showing, the camera is showing an empty chair. We'll come back to him in a minute. He may have just stepped out to refill his coffee or something, hopefully. Uh, Ms. Mark Syndrome? Yes, so I'll second and say yes. Okay, yeah, actually, I think we had a second, but that's okay. Yep. Um, Mr. Uh, Fay. Yes. Okay, Mr. McNamee. Yes. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Joe Morgan. Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Patricia. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, chair is uh, voting a yes. Uh, it's Mr. Malcolm come back. I guess I'll put have to put Malcolm down as an absent here. It's, he, he's still on board, but is, is <laughs> we're looking at an empty chair. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for that presentation, and I concur with uh, Ms. Pecknick's remarks. So we we uh, we love those historical photos and 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 the history. So um, thank you for putting that together. Yeah, thank you um, very it, much. It was really good. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, some it'll, even even us on the historical commission here don't always realize the rich history we have locally here, and it's always always wonderful to see you know the evidence brought up so you know people can it could be brought history can be brought alive again. I can okay. Add one little detail, I, if I oh. can add one little detail, there were three swans swinging around by the seawall on the Merrimack uh, if you walk down there and see it. So the three swans seem to be very appropriate as opposed to the tennis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and you're right, uh, Mark, uh, swans are actually a very, quite a common feature. Now, I haven't seen them in the frog pond, but I have certainly seen them around locally. There's another pond, I forget its name at the moment. It's down kind of uh, down uh, off Hay Street and that road that goes Past it goes by uh, Tender Crop Farm. Uh, I forget the name of that little. There's a little pond there, and there's a pair of swans that have been there. It seems for many, many years. Anyway, well, thanks very much. For, appreciate that presentation. We'll move on. Thank you, on. commissioners. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're welcome. Great. So let's see if we can wrap up here. Um, the let's see, we got those two. Oops, sorry, uh, getting myself organized and disorganized here. There's a couple of quick, yeah? Sorry, um, before we wrap up, can I just say, um, maybe also on behalf of, oh, maybe, hopefully. Um, so we had a demo delay hearing tonight. Yes. And the demo delay process flowchart that's posted on our, right. on the website, says that we vote on historically significant and then, it says demolition plan review. So the applicant right. makes the presentation and there's a right. public hearing. Right. Then after all of that is over, we vote on preferably preserved and say it's preferably preserved and therefore we're imposing a demo delay or it's preferably preserved, but we approve your plan or it's preferably preserved, yeah. but, we're not. but we folded it into one vote again. And so I, I bit my tongue so I didn't want to you know, <laughs> delay that. Maps. But okay. for me, you know, the, the process is the product. Like right. I'm here for the process. And I and I really, since that's on our website and I think it's, we've gotten jammed up in the past by by putting it all in one vote. So can we just go back to that? And I, I think Joe was about to say something about it too, but we were just sort well, of- Well, what I, what I voted for uh, and what was clarified that I was voting for was that it was a historically significant uh, property. Yeah, right. I was assuming that was the first that we would take a second step. Yeah, and I think we just we just slipped up. We didn't we didn't go back to it. Well, uh, 
well, but the way Patricia, Patricia characterized, okay, there were still two votes. Um, what what I did in your right, Patricia, what I did was I, I should have, the, the second vote should have been okay. Uh, it, it is preferably preserved. So, so there's the, there is a, that, imp, that imposes the demolition delay. However, uh, we, with, with that change in plan, we're okay with the, with releasing the demo delay. So, so I, that's probably what the way we should have done it, right? Impose the yeah, delay say, okay, you can, we can lift the delay with this change of plan. We had uh, merged the vote. Exactly. And so you're still, because you had always presented the motion that way, you're, I think you're still in the habit and so am I of saying, let's vote that it's historically significant and preferably preserved. You, you said historically can, significant and, and um, considered, considered for preservation. preservation. But it's is, the preferably preserved considered for preservation has to come after the public hearing and the plan presentation. Well, actually, I have the flow chart here. Yeah, me too. And, yeah. <laughs> and the, the first vote is historically significant and considered for preservation. And not, well, well, no, that's because what that means, Patricia, is that it's up for discussion and for right. our review. Right. I see. The, for, yeah, exactly. For preferably okay. preserved. Right. right. But to then be we considered. The preferably preserved. Yeah, the so, preferably preserved yeah. comes later. For, uh, comes later. Yeah. Okay. I see. So it's it's um, ignores and considered. Okay. That's right. The, that's because that. it could, in rare cases, I don't think I've ever run into one yet, it can be historically significant and not considered because it's like a wreck. Maybe there was a fire or whatever. But yeah. that I, had, I have yet to come yeah. across one. I, I don't know if we've ever voted that way. I think we usually just yeah. say historically I, I don't, significant, but not perfectly preserved because it's a garage yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, it's pretty rare. Okay, I just want to make sure that we don't say preferably preserved till the end. Just yep. I, well, that's why I was careful. To, I know, and the words are very similar, but I thought I was careful yeah, to say okay. considered for preservation. But yeah. Okay. Well, we'll I'll, we'll continue refining it. Because we're still, you know, we're still getting used to this new merge it into one vote and then we separate it back into two like we were supposed to and now we have a new member so we want to make sure we're like that couple new members couple couple new members to be yeah which makes me regret we don't don't meet in person okay what was uh can i move is it okay to move on now oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah sorry okay <laughs> Did, didn't want to cut you off there um, there are just two, not much left, a couple uh, items of correspondence. These are just FYIs. We don't have any motions or votes required on them. 14 Titcombe Street, that's the central congregational church. Those who have been on the board for a while are quite familiar with that one. Uh, it has been uh, signed off by Mass Historic, oh no, uh, yes, it's been signed off by Mass Historic Commission. It's been signed off by the mayor and city council. So it's on its way to the registry to be recorded and, and being a done deal. Uh, and as you, just to remind you that we did get that change and they tried to kind of slip it by with the ability to replace windows with ones not in kind, but that was fixed. Um, the second one is 64 Purchase Street. That was another church, and Joe should, this should ring a bell with you. That was the one that we were gonna try to help them out. In the end, they, they hired someone to help them write the preservation restriction. They sent it down to Mass Historic. Uh, they kicked it back, uh, asking for some updates. So the status of that is that they're incorporating the uh, uh, changes that Mass Historic has asked for. So that is, but it is proceeding. Uh, Another update from the chair it involves the newly formed Energy Advisory Committee. Uh, I assume you saw this on Caitlin's note. Uh, the building that uh, building subcommittee is looking for an NHC representative to advise and facilitate communication between the groups. Um, please see attached mission and goals summary, which actually I did open up somewhere. Let's see if I have that handy. Uh, no, no, not there. Had it somewhere. One of my many, many windows and tabs open here. Maybe if I, where did I, did I do it that? No, not, not that. Well, um, and uh, I'm tempted to nominate a certain member who I think would really be perfect for that. <laughs> Someone who has a certain architectural background hint, hint. <laughs> But I thought uh, I was hoping someone would step forward so the rest of us wouldn't have to take a step back <laughs> and leave someone standing out there in the cold. So uh, I, I 
you know, uh, I know Patricia's wicked busy, as they say, not the Boston, and, and I, I'm already on the other CPC committee myself, as well as this is so. Um, would any, can I also it, explain? Can I say? Yes. Can I explain sure. Something? I did hear from you know some folks in Boston talking about you know statewide conversations with plans to transition from a from you know like the Beacon Hill gas lamps to LED light. Folks in Nantucket are thinking about it, and so someone had asked me whether we, the Historical Commission, were involved in the plans to pilot a, a switch over to LED lights in our historic downtown. And that was news to me that we were doing that. And so I'd mentioned it to um, Andy and Caitlin and it would be great to have, you know, somebody speaking on behalf of our commission mm -hmm. about that issue. And I, I'm not clear, Glenn, if, is this the same yeah. issue? Is this what the point is to talk, energy advisory committees, that to talk about historic lighting in downtown or are there some other topics that that commission committee i would assume it would be more it's not only that topic um caitlin i wonder if yeah, you like green you, green practices mm -hmm. and historic preservation is it stuff like green materials or i think it I, is like green materials and then things like that i don't have their agenda topics but i think it would have to do with the lighting as well because i know that's a topic in the city that we're discussing now mm -hmm. i would and i i would imagine they would be uh, one of the things they could do is make resources available. We have so many older homes here, and as as many of us who own older homes know, they can be rather energy inefficient. And you want to improve the energy efficiency without just you know destroying any historical character or doing things that are going to harm the envelope in some way, like making it too vapor barrier ish, or you know what I mean. There, it gets complicated. But then, but uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, uh, and I, I there was a talk recently that the library sponsored, and then unfortunately I missed, and she, they didn't record it or anything. But you know, making older homes more energy efficient and so on. So anyway, Mr. Um, Son, I think <laughs> yes, I see him. I see him waving his hand. So go ahead, Mark. Yeah, okay, speak, go ahead. speak up. You can never tell if you can see. Yep. Now, I happen to uh, to know one of the. Uh, people involved in this and uh, their goal is really to become a, a resource both for the city and for individuals with regards to being able to provide some new solutions to old problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be extremely helpful for um, our committee, our commission to, to be um, either helped out, advised or uh, be able to be informed about what is actually available for older homes to still remain historically right. intact and still be able to um, integrate some some more green technologies. Uh, and I right. think that, that that's very important. Uh, we tried to get some solar panels on our house in a way that would be um, aesthetically and historically uh, helpful. But the engineers for the company, the solar company looked at the house and said, no way can we do anything in this old house. So I think having, having that, um, um, that type of, um, of consulting ability would be very helpful for the commission. All right, and it's uh, one, I'm told it's one meeting per month. Yeah. Mark, just out of curiosity, they couldn't, they didn't want to touch the house because of its historic character or it just didn't have the right exposure for solar panels or? Um, it was more the ability to install the panels on a structure that they felt uh, was not um, suitable for the, for the panels. Okay. So surely someone could spare one meeting a month to help to try to make this connection between uh, our commission and this other board i'm hoping give people a little bit of a few days to think about it and send send you or caitlin there yeah we could do that if if you want to think nobody, it over. if nobody's leaping forward you know what i mean i, I, mean, I, I like have i have an, i have an interest in it but i do want to find out more about it Ooh, the lighting guy. That would be amazing, <laughs> Mr. McAmey. Of course, that would be amazing. Yeah. I, I would suggest that uh, we invite them to maybe give us a little presentation. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I can do that. I can arrange that for one of the um, upcoming meetings. That would be great, Caitlin. <laughs> okay. That would be great. 
Yeah. So, so Peter, have I, I having been in television production in year, many years ago, uh, one of the things that we always struggled was the heat from all those those incandescent lighting fixtures. So, are they have they gone all LEDs these days? First, they went fluorescent, then they went LED. Yes. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, enough of that digression. Kaylin, thanks. I think they'll be really helpful. And um, and uh, is there someone? Is there some place? Do they, does this committee have a website or anything like that that Peter can can or anyone else can take a look at to find out more? Um, I'll take a look and I'll resend um, the the goals and mission okay. of the group around again, um, okay. and then try and get someone at our next meeting to speak. That would that would be wonderful. Thank you. Well, on that note. I think we can, does anyone else have anything to say before we move to the approval of the minutes from the 11th of February? I'm not seeing, not seeing any, I wish I could see, you know, the squares are small enough and my screen is big enough. I should be able to see all of you, but, but Zoom limits it to what, one, two, three, won't let me see more than six people at a time, but I can also see the hands on the right. Okay, <laughs> so let's move to the, uh, this, would, is there a motion to approve the minutes of 211? I move we approve the minutes from February 11th. Thank you. Mr. McNamee, is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, I didn't catch who that was. Oh, Pete, Mark, thank you, Mark. Um, okay, uh, Ms., did Malcolm come back? Let's see where- Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Malcolm, you know, you missed a vote. We, we went to your video, it, your camera had an empty chair. I had to run down and bleed my <laughs> furnace woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the it joys takes, of the old house. Okay. It's funny. It's just, it takes about two minutes, but those are the two minutes that were most important. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, All right. Well, no, not a big deal. So uh, do you vote to approve the minutes? Yes. You do. Okay. Mark Syndrome? I do. Yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Fay? Yes. Okay. Mr. McNamee? Yes. Okay. Mr. Morgan? Yes. Oh, wait a minute. No, Mr. McNamee, you have to abstain. You weren't here that, that two weeks ago. Right? Well, I made the motion. Maybe we have some <laughs> That's okay. Mr. Ms. Pecknick. Yes. <laughs> and me. Yes, I, I did take a look at them and they, they look, looked fine. Uh, okay. We're, the chair is amenable to a motion to adjourn. No one wants to leave. <laughs> Apparently it's not. not. 11, it's You're not having, eleven thirty p.m. yet. What do you? You're mean? having so much fun. What? You're having so much fun. Too much it's fun. So huh? early. Eight thirty. I moved the weed. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fay. Uh, Mr. Carnwath, you. Yes. Good with the journey. Good. Okay, Mr. Syndrome. Yes. Okay, Mr. Fay. Yes. Mr. McNamee. Yes. You can vote on that one, Joe Morgan. Do we lose Joe? Already He's frozen again. Ah, all right. I'll temporarily skip over him. Ms. Pecknick? Yes. And me? Yes. Well, we have, well, we have a, 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 a quorum voting yes anyway, so we're good. Uh, are you back, Joe? Yes. Okay. Yes. Excellent. What if there's Where never you? a quorum to adjourn? What if there's four people and there's not a quorum? You know? <laughs> then, then the meeting goes on. <laughs> okay. It's we're little... like Charlie on the MTA. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that eventually all four people would agree to end the meeting. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank okay. you. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.